Cool, right at three o'clock. All right, so before we get started, I, I first want to say thanks for everyone for coming. Um, University Veteran Services has hosted several events this month in celebration of Veterans Day. All of our past events, including the Veterans Photo Project, can be found at wisc.edu slash veterans. I invite you all, if you haven't, to take some time and review the photo project on that website. And for our UW veterans in the audience who haven't already, I encourage you to submit your photos and bios for uh, the next edition. Also a quick reminder, we have one more presentation this month scheduled for November 29th, 2.30 to 3.30 in Union South. It's an overview with Dr. Ross Benbow on his National Science Foundation funded study looking at student veterans enrolled here at UW-Madison. So a special thanks to the History Department and Professor John Hall for providing this afternoon's presentation. Many of our student veterans deployed to Afghanistan. This topic is important for our campus community. Professor John Hall, the Ambrose Heslatine Associate Professor of UW Military History and retired US Army Reserve Colonel, served as special historian to the commander of US Central Command during the final months of US operations in Afghanistan and will reflect on its likely legacies for the United States and the 800,000 Americans who served there. Professor Hall is the past president of the Society for Military History with past assignments as a historian to the US Military Academy at West Point, US European Command, US Central Command, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He has also recently returned to UW-Madison to return teaching. Please welcome me, or help me in welcoming John Hall. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Joe, for that uh, introduction, as well as for the invitation to speak today. And thank you also to Jolene, who I think I saw around here a moment ago, for helping to put this uh, event together. Um, thanks also to University Veteran Services for tending to the some 900 student veterans who are continuing their journeys at the University of Wisconsin and for their continued service to their nation by preparing themselves for the next chapter of their lives at this institution. UW has proclaimed this the month of the veteran, for which I'm appreciative. It is also, of course, Native American Heritage Month. As a scholar of American Indian history and an affiliate of our American Indian Studies program, I would be remiss were I to not acknowledge this fact. By now, everyone in the audience has been apprised at least once that the University of Wisconsin sits on the ancestral homelands of the Ho-Chunk, something that bears continued reminder. But as we simultaneously mark the month of the veteran and Native American Heritage Month, I would like to acknowledge and extend my gratitude toward every one of the millions of American men and women who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan over the past 21 years, and to pay special tribute to the more than 600 American Indians and Alaska Natives who gave their lives or were wounded in these operations. I would also like to thank the Ho-Chunk Nation as a whole for mobilizing to support Operation Allies Refuge, the evacuation of evacuation, excuse me, Afghan refugees to safe havens in the United States and elsewhere. Upon learning that many of them, nearly 13,000 by the end, would make temporary home at Wisconsin's Fort McCoy, the Ho-Chunks put out the call to tribal members to support the effort with whatever charitable contributions they could make. Sympathizing with the people who had been displaced from their homelands and paying tribute to the many Ho-Chunks who have bled, sweat, and sacrificed in Afghanistan to ensure a better future for the people of that country. Now, I know there are some in the room who played a significant part in Operation Allies Refuge. My thanks to you as well. And I know that the audience today contains a fair number of veterans from what proved to be America's longest war, that in Afghanistan. Here I wish to issue a very clear disclaimer. I am not a veteran of that war. Some 800,000 soldiers, Marines, sailors, airmen, and guardians have served there. I am not one of them. Nor am I a veteran of the war in Iraq. I am a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars by virtue only of a few dozen, maybe hundred cups of coffee in Kosovo. My father and brother are both combat veterans. I am not. 
I therefore approach this topic with tremendous humility, not as a veteran or somebody with authoritative personal experience, but rather as a historian who had the uncommon opportunity to observe historic events as they unfolded from the safe and relatively comfortable confines of the US Central Command Headquarters in Tampa, Florida, where for a year and a half, I served as a special historian and a speechwriter for its commander, Marine General Kenneth F. Frank McKenzie, Jr. I'm not gonna speak for him today, and it should go without saying that none of my remarks should be construed as the official position of either CENTCOM or the Department of Defense. I'm gonna offer these remarks in two chapters. First, the anamnesis referred to in my title, the memories of my former life as an Army Reserve officer on the personal staff of the CENTCOM commander. These are going to be relatively brief as my recollections as a backbencher are not in themselves historically significant. In other words, I will not tell stories that are not mine to tell, leaving them to the principal actors in the dramatic events of 2021. I will, however, reiterate a number of important points that have already been made publicly, but I fear were lost in the din of the moment. The second chapter of my talk is referred to in its subtitle, and here I'm gonna be far less reticent. Professionally, I have studied the history of America's military triumphs and misadventures for the past 21 years. That span happens to coincide almost perfectly with the duration of US military involvement in Afghanistan. As such, it has loomed in the background of my career as a military historian, affording me ample time to reflect on how it fits or will fit into the broader sweep of this story. I hope to offer you a first draft of my thoughts on that subject. But first, chapter one. Let's call it an indecent interval. This is, of course, a play on the theory that the Nixon administration's strategy in the final years of the Vietnam War was to find a way to make a marginally graceful exit from Southeast Asia, leaving the South Vietnamese government holding the bag. The best that Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger might have hoped for, according to this theory, is that the Republic of Vietnam and its army could hold on just long enough for the United States to be able to make the credible claim that it did all that it could. To this day, scholars debate whether this truly was the policy of the Nixon administration, and it may further be debated whether the three years that passed between the withdrawal of US forces and the fall of Saigon provided the decent interval that the administration purportedly sought. Certainly, Americans were distraught by the images of North Vietnamese tanks bowling through the gates of the presidential palace, refugees thronging to board a helicopter at the roof of an apartment building near the U.S. Embassy, and a similar helicopter being thrown into the South China Sea from a flat top. But I would argue that these images provided merely the coda to a war that the United States had already considered over and beyond daily concern. In other words, whether by plan or by accident, three years did constitute a decent interval in the case of Vietnam. In the case of Afghanistan, two months provided no such interval. It was so brief, in fact, that it rendered obscure to most Americans that the withdrawal of American forces and the subsequent non-combatant evacuation from Kabul were two distinct missions. And it certainly made impossible to recognize, let alone acknowledge, that each of these operations was a success. I realize that this claim may strike many in the room as incredible, which is precisely why no one made any such claim in the days or even months that followed. The images of Afghan civilians swarming the airfield at Hamid Karzai International Airport, which I will hereafter refer to as H. Kaya, were shocking and indelible. The subsequent bombing at Abbey Gate on August 26th which left 13 American service members dead, was a heart-rending tragedy compounded three days later by the killing of Zamari Ahmadi and nine members of his family in a misplaced drone strike. These events covered in real time and broadcast into the living rooms of Americans who had largely diverted their attention from the war in Afghanistan for years were disturbing to say the very least. And I think it's fair to say that the national reaction was to ask what the hell is going on?
Only five months earlier, President Biden announced his decision to withdraw American forces from Afghanistan, the name of which had largely dropped out of the news cycle until its collapse appeared imminent in August. The public naturally inferred cause and effect, an inference zealously reinforced by certain news outlets covering the events of August 2021. As an American military historian, I should add here that there is absolutely nothing new about the domestic political opponents of a sitting administration trying to score points for the alleged misdirection or mismanagement of military operations. Indeed, exceptions have been few and remarkable, and little in American history lends credence to Senator Arthur Vandenberg's claim in 1948 that politics stops at the water's edge. Quite the contrary, partisan disagreements and carping over foreign policy or the conduct of wars have been a feature of American democracy. If not since the revolution, then certainly at least since the quasi-war with France at the end of the 18th century. What is new, however, is the present mediascape, which enables the rapid and relentless crowdsourcing of the partisan critique. I watched this unfold last August as opposition consensus concretized in what seemed like minutes. It comprised several elements. Giving up Bagram Air Base was a mistake of the first order. Not far behind, passing on the Taliban offer for US forces to establish security in all of Kabul. Also, the proposition that the commander of US CENTCOM and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff should have resigned when the president rejected their advice to maintain a few thousand troops in Afghanistan for the foreseeable future. And most fundamentally, that President Biden's decision to withdraw US forces from Afghanistan was a historic strategic blunder and the proximate cause for the Afghan government's collapse. This last one was and remains complicated, however, by the fact that the previous president of the opposition party was the one who made the initial deal with the Taliban that provided for the withdrawal of US and NATO forces in 2021. And the fact that most Americans, regardless of party, wanted that war to end. These inconvenient truths produced a convenient quibble. I wanted US forces out, just not that way. What the alternative ways might have been isn't always clear, but at a minimum, they involved holding on to Bagram and not trusting the Taliban. I'm not gonna pretend to set the record straight on these matters because General McKenzie already did so when he testified to the House and Senate Armed Services Committees in September of 2021. I will, however, reinforce or reiterate a several, several important points. First, the Doha Agreement of February 2020 served notice to both the Taliban and the Afghan government that the US was out. For the architects of this agreement, the 18 months that ensued were a decent enough interval for them to wash their hands of responsibility for subsequent events. But this was in fact the precipitating event that began the death spiral of the government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Next, the American profession of arms is more thoroughly dedicated to the principle of civilian control of the military than any in history of which I am aware. Its senior leaders understand that resigning in protest is in fact a subversion of this principle, one with the potential to do immense harm to the Republic. As Duke political scientist Peter Fever has argued, elected officials have the right to be wrong. The obligation of senior military officers is to render their professional military advice and carry out the legal directions of the president and the secretary of defense. Regardless of intent or political affiliation, resigning because one's advice isn't heeded is an inherently political act one that would have the effect of cowing presidents afraid of the political fallout of their senior uh, generals and admirals resigning. Moreover, the decisions that, according to some, should have driven the brass to resign were in fact military decisions. And this is where the timing is crucial to understanding what actually transpired. In April of 2021, 
President Biden announced his decision that all U.S. forces would be out by September 11th. This set in motion the swift and responsible retrograde of all U.S. forces, as well as our NATO allies, in coordination with the Afghan Ministry of Defense and its defense forces. This withdrawal was complete well before the September 11th deadline, but it was neither hasty nor disorganized. Because the direction was to go to zero, there was no scenario in which retaining Bagram Air Base was possible. Anyone in the room who's been there can attest to its sprawling expanse. H. Kaya, on the other hand, was in the capital of Kabul, which was naturally home to the U.S. Embassy and its security de detail, which would presumably remain after the withdrawal of U.S. and NATO combat forces. Were a non-combatant evacuation to become necessary, Kabul is also home to most of the people that would need to be evacuated. Unfortunately, this is exactly what transpired. Following the withdrawal of US forces, the Taliban steadily, then rapidly, rolled up a series of provincial capitals before restricting, constricting around Kabul itself. Fearful of triggering a precipitous rush for the exits and the resulting brain drain, neither the Afghan government nor the US Department of State wanted to request a non-combatant evacuation operation, or NEO, until the last possible moment. Even before then, the Defense Department had read the writing on the wall and set in motion the requisite forces for the NEO. They had not yet arrived when Afghan civilians swamped H. Kaya on August 16th, but they did within hours and quickly reestablished security. Contingency plans called for the introduction of yet larger forces and the potential seizure of Bagram, but only in the event that the Taliban actively impeded the NEO. They did not. Quite the contrary, Taliban and Western interests aligned in one important regard in August of 2021. We wanted out, they wanted us out. This cooperation had limits, of course. The notion that the Taliban would let U.S. forces secure all of Kabul after it had already penetrated that city with loosely organized fighters should elicit raised eyebrows rather than hand-wringing over supposedly missed opportunities. But the Taliban did, in fact, provide a reliable, if transactional, partner in establishing an outer cordon security perimeter around Hkaya. In the wake of the Abbey Gate bombing, common refrain among critics was, what do you expect when you rely on the Taliban for your security? But there is zero evidence that the Taliban was complicit in that attack, which was carried out by ISIS Khorasan, a sworn enemy of the Taliban. Ultimately, the US and its allies were able to evacuate some 124,000 Americans, third country nationals, and at-risk Afghans to safety, not without cost, but nevertheless successfully and under incredibly adverse circumstances. Although from a distance of nearly 8,000 miles, I can attest to the immense feelings of relief and accomplishment that accompanied the live feed sight of the last C-17 departing H. Kaya and soon after exiting Afghan airspace. But in claiming that these two concluding operations of America's longest war were successful, I cannot deny that the war itself was a failure. It might have been a success had the United States defined its war aims more modestly, but it did not. We may debate whether or not Afghanistan remains today a haven from which enemies of the West may plot and launch attacks against the United States and its allies, but what is undeniable is that Afghanistan is once again under the rule of a deplorable misogynistic regime that retains warm ties to Al-Qaeda and which is too fractious to make good on any claims of being a kinder, gentler version of the Taliban that the United States helped to depose in 2001. I have neither the time nor the expertise to mediate on the reasons for the failure of the NATO mission to refashion Afghanistan as a functioning republic in Central Asia. General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, offered some preliminary thoughts of the, on the matter in his own concurrent congressional testimony. And my friends and colleagues, Carter Melkasian and Christopher Kalenda, have recent books that I commend to your attention, as do David Kilcullen and Greg Mills, along with a legion of armchair strategists. I'll simply tease the second chapter of this speech by saying that, despite 
the current scholarly fascination with all things related to American imperialism, the United States is actually very uncomfortable behaving like an archetypical imperial power, which not infrequently and paradoxically sometimes benefits neither the metropole nor the periphery. But before closing chapter one, I'd like to reiterate a few important points. First, the NEO was a completely separate mission from the withdrawal, which was already complete. Without a decent interval to separate the two, this seems to most Americans like a distinction without a difference, but it matters to those who served in each effort. As I've already stated, both of these missions were successful, and those who contributed to either of them have every right to be proud of what they accomplished. Second, it is now apparent with hindsight that whenever US forces left, the collapse of the Afghan government and security forces was bound to follow. We now know that with only two months warning, President Trump abortively ordered the withdrawal of all US forces from Afghanistan by January 15th, 2021. Had that order stood, it would have resulted in a truly hasty exit with scenes hardly more pleasing than those I have alluded to. Instead, he let stand the Doha Agreement of February 2020, which provided for the withdrawal of all U.S. forces by May 1, 2021. President Biden kicked that can another five months down the road, but regardless of when U.S. forces left, I think we can now appreciate that they and their NATO allies were like the proverbial Dutch boy with his finger in the dike, only without any hope of relief in the morning. When people say they supported the withdrawal of U.S. forces, just not that way. What they're really saying, whether they realize it or not, is I wish there had been a decent interval. And now, chapter two. Consider this a sequel to a talk I gave for the Wisconsin Academy of Science, Arts, and Letters shortly after arriving in Madison 13 years ago, entitled Warfare and Public Perception in 2050. I don't expect anyone here to have attended or remember that talk, so I'll give a very brief summary. I had to rewatch that speech to remind myself of exactly what I said, and I was struck by two things. First, how much younger I looked only 12 years ago, and second, how wrong I was when I said that neither Russia nor China would pose an exigent military threat to American interests in the foreseeable future. To my credit, I opened that talk by professing my mistrust, distrust, for anyone who claims the ability to predict the future. And in that regard, at least, I was spot on. <laughs> that talk was part of a series of lectures on the world we can anticipate in 2050. And I was asked to participate because my final military assignment on active duty before coming here to work for the history department was as the chief of the future studies branch of the future warfare division of Army's Training and Doctrine Command. That talk also was in two chapters, the first encompassing the previous 40 years, running back to the end of the Vietnam War, and the second looking forward to how the legacies of that conflict and the then ongoing wars in Iraq and Afghanistan would likely influence popular support for wars in 2050. My essential argument was that the legacies of the Vietnam War had profoundly shaped not merely the manpower policy of the American defense establishment, but indeed the social contract between American society and its military, which would likely remain in force through 2050. The advent of the all-volunteer force in 1973, I argued, represented something of a divorce between the American people and their armed forces. The rupture was acrimonious, and the new relationship was strained by the military sense that it had been betrayed by an unappreciative American public. Although certainly subject to exaggeration, the military's collective memory of the war in Vietnam was that it won every battle only to have victory squandered by the least great generation and to have its veterans treated shamefully upon their return home. Whether the United States had in fact abandoned victory is something scholars still debate today and well beyond the scope of this lecture. But the idea that the nation at least abandoned its own veterans of the war in Vietnam became so widespread that contrition gave way to eventual reconciliation between the American public and its military. Beginning in the 80s, a new social contract emerged. In return for unwavering support for American troops, However, superficially, Americans were free to live their lives free 
from the prospect of being drafted. Also emerging in the 1980s was a new, albeit momentary, consensus about the proper use of this all-volunteer force. Codified in the so-called Weinberger-Powell Doctrine of the Reagan administration, it reflected a generation's moral lessons from the Vietnam War without reconciling them to their physical embodiment in the all-volunteer force. It was essentially a checklist for avoiding another Vietnam. Only use military force when there's overwhelming popular support to do so. Once committed, use overwhelming force, overwhelmingly. Make sure there's a clear exit strategy. In other words, no more quagmires, and so on. As a West Point cadet in the early 1990s, I was introduced to the Weinberger-Powell Doctrine as though it were gospel. And why wouldn't I be? The army into which I was about to be commissioned had been restored to popular esteem, and the Weinberger-Powell Doctrine seemed to assure that it would only be used in the future to fight good wars. The warming light of World War II could thereby dispel the shadow cast by Vietnam. But there were two problems with the Weinberger-Powell Doctrine. The first is that it was ill-suited to the world that emerged following the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s. As the guy wires, the Cold War snapped across Eastern Europe and the world, the United States discovered that it was not, as Francis Fukuyama famously postulated, at the end of history, but rather at the beginning of a new chapter, or maybe even a new volume. One that seemed to call for, in the lexicon of the day, military operations other than war. Thus, the risk-averse conservatism of the Weinberger-Powell Doctrine ran headlong into the new realities of a unipolar world and the liberal internationalism of the Clinton administration. The conflict came to a head in 1992 with Secretary of State Madeleine Albright demanding of Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Colin Powell, what's the point of having this superb military you're always talking about if we can't use it? Powell, who a decade earlier had been the principal author of the doctrine that bore his name, later recalled that he nearly had an aneurysm. To him and so many of his generation, evidently Donald Trump and Joe Biden among them, the lessons of history were clear. The American armed forces are for winning wars decisively and nothing else. But this brings us to the second problem of the Weinberger-Powell Doctrine. While it was merely an idea that could be contested and disagreed with, the other legacy of the Vietnam War of which I've spoken was an enduring reality that could be deployed, the all-volunteer force. And deploy it did, to the Balkans, to Haiti, to Somalia, and eventually to Afghanistan and Iraq. The only one of these operations that remotely adhered to the Weinberger-Powell Doctrine was, ironically, the one that is today most commonly compared to Vietnam, Afghanistan. Its principal virtue by light of the Weinberger-Powell Doctrine was that it was, at its outset, wildly popular. The terrorist attacks of 9-11 imbued the nation with a spirit of vengeance that it had not known for 60 years. And the ranks of the all-volunteer force swelled with a quarter of a million new volunteers in the year that followed 9-11. But Operation Enduring Freedom failed other essential tests of the Weinberger-Powell Doctrine, most notably a clearly defined achievable end state or an exit strategy. Especially once distracted and distraught by an elective war in Iraq, Americans lost enthusiasm for the war in Afghanistan and the global war on terror generally. Yet both wars, despite their mounting unpopularity, continued to trundle along, a phenomenon best explained by the all-volunteer force, and the new social contract, which promised and delivered unconditional, albeit passive support to the men and the women of this force, even if not for the operations that they were conducting. This phenomenon was not lost on the number of conscientious critics of what Andrew Bacevich has labeled the new American militarism. Writing for the New York Times in 2013, the historian David Kennedy and the retired three-star Army general come U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan, Carl Eikenberry, warned that the greatest challenge to our military is not from a foreign enemy, it's the widening gap between the American people and their armed forces. I agreed with, what the, with, the, excuse me, with the bulk of what Kennedy and Eikenberry had to say. Indeed, much of that article reads like a transcript of the speech I had given three years earlier. But as a 19th century historian, I couldn't help but object to the idea that there was anything new about an all-volunteer constabulary toiling on distant frontiers, 
conducting operations that attracted little popular attention except when something bad happened. They were alarmed that the officer corps of this all-volunteer force comprised a self-perpetuating military caste, sharply segregated from larger society and with its enlisted ranks disproportionately recruited from the disadvantaged. They warned, history suggests that such scenarios do not end well. But to the contrary, this had been the norm for the first century and a half of the American Republic, deviated from only in the event of major wars until 1948. That year saw the introduction of a new normal of a peacetime draft that lasted only 25 years, but nevertheless represented a more authentic American tradition to people of that generation, Kennedy and Eikenberry among them. Their proposed solution, reinstate the draft, restoring the nation's tradition on relying not on professional warriors, but on citizen soldiers, and thereby closing the breach that opened between America and its military, and which had permitted the prosecution of forever wars. Now, aside from the political infeasibility of reinstituting the draft, there are two problems with their proposal. First, it fails to acknowledge the extent to which the men and women of today's all-volunteer force are citizen soldiers in the traditional sense. That was not true of the enlisted ranks of the 19th century, the armies that I study. They were drawn almost exclusively from the disenfranchised immigrants and hard luck cases with very few options in civilian life and regarded by the public not as American heroes, but as loathsome loafers, the antithesis of the citizen soldier ideal. This is simply not the case today, when there are roughly three reservists or guardsmen for every five members of the active component, and in which the army reserve actually outnumbers the regular army, the largest of the active duty services. The roughly 800,000 members of the reserve component today are the clearest embodiment of the citizen soldier tradition and indispensable links between society at large and the US military. But even in the active component, over half of all enlisted troops are under the age of 25. Most of them serve one or two enlistments and then return to civilian life, bolstering the number of veterans in the population at large and likewise helping to connect the American military to the society that it serves. A standard line deployed in the lament about this attenuated relationship between the military and the population at large is that so few actually serve in the military. We often hear numbers of less than 1% or 1% banding about, but as of the last census, veterans comprised roughly 7% of the American population, and over 3 million of them are veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So successfully have they set aside the role of the soldier to resume that of the citizen, to bend George Washington's phrase, that most of them pass in plain sight, not part of any military caste, but rather your very neighbors and coworkers. Many of them are in this room. I'll thank them for their service without asking them to identify themselves. But I will encourage, as Joe did at the open, everyone here to visit the Badger Veteran Photo Project, this initiative that highlights the accomplishments of the veterans in our midst, both in uniform and in the campus community. You will be heartened by what and who you see and rest confident that the very best elements of the American citizen soldier tradition are alive and well, and alive and well right here at UW. The second problem with the kennedy eikenberry proposition is that it, invo excuse me, it avoids entirely the facts that a draft is no guarantee against military misadventure, see Vietnam, and that restricting the range of military operations to what a draft susceptible population will bear may not be in the nation's best interests. Put otherwise, reinstating the draft will not necessarily prevent future administrations from launching ill-advised wars, yet it could dissuade one from undertaking prudent military action that does not measure up to the Weinberger-Powell doctrine or promise decisive military victory. This is essentially what the US and NATO missions in Afghanistan had devolved to by the time Presidents Trump and Biden decided to end them. For a relatively modest investment of forces, the U.S. and its allies were able to safeguard the vulnerable progress of their nation-building efforts that they, that they had thus far yielded, 
keep the Taliban at bay and continue active counterterrorism operations against Al Qaeda and ISIS Khorasan. In the cold calculus of national security and risk mitigation, the proposal to leave a few thousand American troops and twice as many NATO troops in Afghanistan for the foreseeable future made considerable sense, and not just for the military commanders who recommended such a course. Indeed, that our NATO allies, most of which have strong anti-militarist streaks and do rely on compulsory service to man their forces, were willing to foot two-thirds of the human bill for remaining in Afghanistan and that they were urging us to stay says something. It does not say categorically or definitively that we should have stayed. These are, after all, just merely this historian's early reflections on the end of America's longest war. And I suspect that debates on this question will last longer than did the war itself. The question reminds me, however, of one that was posed to retired General Hal Moore when he delivered one of his final speeches to the Corps of Cadets at West Point in the mid-2000s. Moore was famous for commanding the 1st Battalion of the 7th Cavalry in the Battle of the Idrang Valley in 1965, and for his memoir, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, which was the basis for the 2002 Mel Gibson movie of a similar name. After his prepared remarks during the Q&A, a cadet asked the general, what he thought Vietnam would look like had the United States won the Vietnam War. Moore contemplated the question for a moment before responding. There'd probably still be American troops in Vietnam, and they'd probably still be getting shot at with some frequency. It was a good question and a fascinating, thoughtful answer. Of course, there's nothing to say that Hal Moore was correct, but it seems at the very least to have been a plausible answer, perhaps even likely which led me in turn to wonder, would victory such, a, such as this have been worth it? I'm inclined to think not. Today, the Socialist Republic of Vietnam is a vital trading partner of the United States, incongruously manufacturing much of the ice hockey equipment that hangs in my basement. Far more significantly, it is a key regional partner and part of the Biden administration's new Indo-Pacific economic framework for prosperity. This is more than just a trade deal. It's part of a broader strategy to compete with the rising threat to US interests and the region posed by China. And Vietnam is a crucial part of this. No one could have predicted this in 1972 or even after the passage of a decent interval in 1975. And no one can now predict what the future holds for Afghanistan. As I disclaimed earlier in my talk, there are two kinds of futurists, lucky ones and liars. It nevertheless seems plausible to me that some battalion commander who fought through the Korangal Valley rather than the I Drang might in the future address the Corps of Cadets at West Point and receive the same question posed to Hal Moore. What would Afghanistan look like today if we had won? and that the same answer would suffice. We'd still have forces there still getting shot at. That's what President Biden foresaw and foreswore. As commander in chief, it was his prerogative to do so. And I do not have a doubt that he was certain that he was making the right decision as measured by American ideals and interests, as well as by what he could justify to America's citizen soldiers, not taking for granted that facile support would suffice to compensate them for their continued sacrifices. Whether it was the right decision, time may tell, but it may not. Regardless, the men and women who served, sacrificed, and suffered there did their duty over a span of 20 years hopeful of safeguarding not only the security of the United States and its allies, but also a better future for the people of Afghanistan. As that country today teeters on the brink of a humanitarian and human rights catastrophe under Taliban misrule, we ought not surrender to schadenfreude and hope that it tumbles over the precipice. Nor should we take for granted that things will necessarily get better with the passage of time. But if the flame of hope there for a better life yet flickers among the people, we should thank the 800,000 Americans and their NATO allies for kindling it in the first place. They have my thanks, as do all of you for being here this afternoon. Thank you very much.